you joined with us last week, if you did, and if not, you're here in a series that we started called The Word Works. And what you see happening among us just today is all in the Word of God. Whether it is God transforming a heart, making a new creation out of someone that says, Lord, I need to be born again, or I need to rededicate my life to you. Or whether that's, Lord, I need a miracle and I'm believing for it today and you'll get the praise reports of that, of what will come out of what these encounters have been today. But it's all part of the word works. Listen, I felt real strongly, and I don't always give this explanation, but I felt real strongly when my brother gave a tongue this morning to give some explanation because when you start seeing supernatural demonstrations and you're not used to going to a church where the supernatural happens, where people, where if, if you're just used, to, and I'm not trying to be mean to any other church, but sometimes churches get into religious formalities. And when you get into religious formalities and you start pushing out the supernatural, the you, 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 Bible says you grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And when you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, you won't see very much supernatural demonstration there. But where we allow the supernatural demonstration to operate, God is still the same God and He'll do it. But you may be here asking, man, I, I've never seen this in my church. Well, that's all right. As Kevin said earlier, it's Bible. It's in the Bible. So, so... That's why I shared that earlier because it's extremely important for people to not get freaked out and wigged out and think this is just a bunch of crazy people. No, this is some passionate people that love Jesus and want the power of God moving among us. That's our heart's cry. Jesus can do in a moment, the work of the Holy Spirit can do in a moment what years of preaching and church ministry will not do. I'm not here negating that, but I am saying that we need the move of God. If we've ever needed a move of God in our country, in our community, it's now, it's today. Nobody has that your politicians don't have the answers government does not have the answer companies don't have the answer people are going crazy in the world today there's only one hope and one answer and I believe it's God and I believe it's his word and I, here, here's what we need we need God to move and when he does move let's not get freaked out and run crazy and say it's a bunch of just say God whatever you want to do do it in me do it with me do it in my heart do it in my life do it in my family I need you today and you'll watch he's so good he'll show up for you like that so I just want to encourage you in that today and just receive from the Lord and I know you have been so uh, anyway you're in this series with us called the word works and we're talking about three things about the word working last week we talked about the promises of God they work right Jesus said destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again guess what happened on the third day he got back up again amen he got by many infallible proofs, the Bible says. So Jesus got back up again. There's, there's, did you know there's 5,500 manuscripts that deal with the New Testament and the reality of Jesus? Did you know there's extra biblical writings that talk about Jesus, such as the great Jewish historian Joseph, or, or, or uh, uh, Josephus, Flavius Josephus? He wrote about Jesus wrote about the day that he was crucified, wrote about a lot of stuff. But, but, and, and I'm not trying to make that Bible. That's not Bible. I just want you to say, when people question their head, is Jesus really real? Did he get up out of that grave? I'm telling you, by many infallible proofs, Jesus is alive. And I can tell you another proof today. All these changed lives that you see around here, like the ex-drug addicts you're sitting next to and the ex-dope heads that you're sitting next to, the, 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 the ex-whatever people that were involved in multiple relationships and all kinds of stuff. Listen, and I'm not here calling anybody by names because I'm pointing back at me. I wasn't raised up in church. I was a hellion, man. And I'm telling you right now, Jesus Christ changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. And, and he's many of you around here. And it's just by simply saying, Lord, here I am. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. And he can write your story, man, in a powerful way and in a beautiful way. So I just want to say to you today uh, that, that the promises of God are real. And you believe on the Lord and he'll do it. But, but to the second portion, you're here today. And it's called prophecy. So the word works in promises and in prophecy. And we're going to talk, talk next week we're going to talk about purpose. The word works for your purpose. You were no accident. I don't care how you got here. 
I don't care if your mama went crazy. I don't care if your daddy left home. I don't care if you were raised in a single family home. I don't care what happened. I, I don't care if it was a one night stand and you got here. God still has a plan. God still has a plan. And he still got a purpose for your life. And no matter how you got here, no matter how that all came about, God can redeem it. God can make it to what the enemy meant for bad and destruction. God can turn it around for good. And he's got a purpose for your life. That's next week, all right? So you're going to connect with me this week. Let's, so listen, there's 351 prophecies themselves about Jesus Christ. 351 prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You imagine that 351. Now let's talk about prophecy for just a few minutes. Prophecy has about three dimensions to it. Three dimensions. One is foretelling. The other one is foretelling. And then the other one is telling for. Foretelling, foretelling, and telling for. That's what is, you see in prophecy. Now, when we start talking prophecy, everybody wants to know about end times and what's going to happen next. Now, we'll get to some of that. The, the, the situation of preaching end times is not my goal today. It's my goal today and what I feel like the Lord has put in my heart is to help you to understand God's not confused about what's happening in the world today. And he's not confused about you being a part of it now. He can tell you, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself because he knows that tomorrow is in his hand and he's able to take care of you in your tomorrow. Amen? So there's 351 prophecies about the coming of Jesus and Jesus fulfilled all 351. Now I've done some of the math for you before, not me specifically, but went and done the research to get it for you. Did you know... To fulfill the top eight prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Now there's 351 he fulfilled. But to fulfill the top eight. The math behind one human being born among. Now the, 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 there's some researchers. It's called the Population Research uh, Council. Says that of the homo sapien kind human beings. 108 billion people has lived on planet Earth. I don't know how they come up with that number, and those numbers are up to them, not me. But let's say, for the sake, they're right. 108 billion. Okay, so that's 108 with nine zeros behind it. All right? 108 billion. For Jesus, this one man, to fulfill just eight of the 365 prophecies the chances of it being anyone else is 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros behind it. And he fulfilled 351. So prophecy is important. Here's what prophecy tells me. God knows what he's talking about. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's saying. So that's an incredible, that's an incredible Thing. So, so let's look at prophecy for just a few minutes. The Oxford Dictionary, of the which I'm not a, good, a big fan of, but you know what the, pro, the, the Oxford Dictionary says about prophecy? That it's a prediction. Wikipedia gets it a little bit better. It says a prophecy is a message that is claimed by a prophet to have been communicated to them by a deity. Such messages typically involve inspiration, interpretation, and revelation of a divine will concerning the prophet's social world and the events that are to come. But Webster, Marion Webster, who was a born-again Christian, I think gets it a whole lot closer. He says, it's an inspired utterance of a prophet. The function or the vocation of a prophet, specifically the inspired declaration of divine will and purpose from God. So what is a prophetic word? It's simply a word delivered under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that accurately communicates God's thoughts and his intentions. So to prophesy would happen in one of three ways, as I've already said, foretelling. 
Foretelling is the declaration of a future event revealed from the Lord pertaining especially to the kingdom of God. So you got that? Foretelling is the, and not fortune telling, foretelling is the declaration of future events as revealed from the Lord pertaining especially to the kingdom of God. Forth telling is to utter forth declare a thing which can only be known by divine revelation. Declare the, the divine will to impart the purpose of God or to make known in any way the truth of God such as designated to influence people and then to tell forth. Simply means to say what God is saying in that moment. So, with those things being established, I want to read to you one of the most profound prophecies in the Old Testament that doesn't have to do with Jesus to just share something with you and then we're going we to hook up the chain and we're going to move on on some prophetic work. Y'all remember what we done last week with the, uh, with the promises of God at the end of service? Yeah, we're going to do that today with some prophecies, okay? So, so we, we're going to get into this thing. So I want you, I, now I know you've been worshiping for a while and your, leg, your spirit is willing but your legs are weak. You know, your spirit is willing, but your legs might be weak because you've been standing a while, jumping a while. That's all right. I've been on mine since about 5 o'clock this morning. We're good. We're good. You can do it. If, if, if my legs can carry this around for that long, you got this. You got this. Here, here's, here is a prophecy, listen to me, that some people do their best to try to challenge because the acute accuracy of it. There are people that will say, that the, the book of Isaiah had to be written in two parts or at least much later than it was written. However, there is so much articulation to specific time periods and specific events that would only be known by the writer documenting within real time. So it's refudiated, in my opinion, to say that the prophecies that are in the book of Isaiah would have been written later. They say that about the book of Daniel as well. But there's too much that shows, no, this was happening in real time. Now, I understand why people do that. They don't want to say there's a God because if they say there's a God, then you got to be accountable to this God. But if you don't believe in a God, you get to do whatever you want to, right? So just kick God out and do whatever you want to. The problem is you can't kick out his reality. He's real. And so because he's real, what's he like? Remember I told you in this series we would answer some questions. Who is God? What's he like? And the second question is, so who am I? Who is God and what is he like? So, so this, is, this is a prophecy. Isaiah 45. Are you there? Say amen. That was quick, wasn't it? I know I didn't give you any time. Isaiah 45. Uh, it's, that's all right. They'll, these amazing media people will have it on the screen for you. Isaiah 45, 1 through 3. Watch this. You might not catch it at first, but I'm going to give you some detail. The Bible says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him, and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break into pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Now, you don't want to know what's significant about that? You know when he prophesied that? 150 to 160 years before it ever happened. You don't want to know another significant thing about that? The Babylonians hadn't even risen to power and the people that was going to destroy the Babylonians called the Persians had not risen to the world power that they, were, that they both were eventually going to be. The Babylonian Empire had already started but it was not ruling the world to the degree and the level that it was going to. During the preaching of Jeremiah, the prophet, King Nebuchadnezzar, invaded the nation, of Israel, or the, the nation of Judah 
and he took captive the people of Israel. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, listen, was the king of Babylon. He came in and he took them captive and he took them back to Babylon in three separate waves. He took the smartest, brightest, and the most likely to succeed first. And he brought them into his kingdom and then he came back and got some more. Then he came back and got some more. Three different times. And he took them all to Babylon in order to build his own kingdom. And when he'd done that, he took them back there. He's fulfilling a prophecy that said that Jeremiah said, you're going to be there for 70 years. But God said in this prophecy that there would be a king named Cyrus that would allow the people of God to go free and go back to their homeland. But Cyrus is the king of another kingdom called Persia. Cyrus wasn't even born yet. But God, in the heart of this prophet, Isaiah begins to move on him with the Holy Spirit, much like he did some of these earlier, and he began to put out the prophetic declaration that there would be a man by the name of Cyrus that, would, that he would be used of the Lord. His life would be used by the Lord to allow the people of God to go back. And no matter what it looked like, see the Babylonians had such a world influence that God uses some imagery about the gates of brass and iron as though they were impenetrable. As though the Babylonians were so strong, no one could penetrate them. But God said, Cyrus, you'll be that guy. Later on, 150 years later, to 160 years later, a man by the name of Cyrus has now made it to the kingship of the kingdom of Persia. He has gone in and overthrown the Babylonians, and he formed some relationship with some of those Jews that are there, and some of those Jews have the favor of God on their life, and Cyrus, king of Persia, begins to start letting people go back to their homeland and start rebuilding the temple and start rebuilding some walls and establishing the nation of Israel again, fulfilling this prophecy that was mentioned in Isaiah. Now you say, Pastor, why are you telling us all of this? Because here is why I want to tell you. God knows what he's talking about. Now, I want to give you a couple of things about prophecy real quick, and then we're going to close this thing out. Are you ready? Let's fasten our seatbelts real quick. Let me give you a couple. I know this is more nerdy stuff for just a minute, but it's important that you get a little bit of the nerdy stuff so that you don't think that people are just hoping without hope. They are hoping against anything that says it's hopeless. If this world says it's hopeless, I can tell you right now, God says, I'll show you what the hope is. I'm going to give it to you in just a few minutes. Last week, we shouted on some promises. I'm going to tell you some things that's about to take place in just the near future that you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to, be, uh, you don't have to get all in a wad about stuff. You just have to know that your God has a plan. Now, listen to me. I want to show you a couple things real quickly because I, I want you to recognize how this operates. When you see prophecy, it is things that are going to take place no matter what. And some people struggle with how prophecy works in person's real-time life. The reason is, is because there's a way of thinking that's gotten interjected into the kingdom of God that I think is, that is flawed. One of them is on the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm not saying that I don't believe God is sovereign. I do believe God is sovereign. But where people that have been taught the totality of the sovereignty of God, they begin to lose the responsibility of human beings. Then there's another group of people that teach free will. That it's all about free will. The problem with that is what do you do when God does things sovereignly? So you say, Pastor, what do you believe? I believe them both. Well, you're going to have to reconcile that for me so that I understand. Here's what I believe. I believe that some prophetic things and certain things in God's sovereignty, 
He has declared, and no amount of crying, spitting, declaring, stomping, raising torment, pitching a fit is ever going to change that. Nothing. You're not going to change that. I don't care how bad you don't want the daylight to click along today that you wish today lasted 75 hours, it's not going to. At the same time, in the sovereignty of God, God gave dominion to humanity in the garden. When he gave dominion to humanity, man then had a choice inside of that sovereign will. So inside of the sovereignty of God, there's some prophecies that's coming in the future that you can't change. You're just marching toward. But you can make a choice to participate in them in one sense or the other. Okay? You can make a choice. So for instance, there's prophetic words about what happens after you die. You ain't got there yet. But you're going. You go in the sovereignty of God, man is going to die. Hello? You're going to get there. You're going to get up into some prophecy in your life. But in the sovereign will of God, God says, then man only has two destinations, heaven or hell. You have to choose to participate in which prophetic utterance you want. Do you want to participate in heaven? Or do you want to participate with the boogeyman? Huh? That is where God says, choose this day whom you'll serve. That's where God says that if you believe on him, you have to activate that. So we've been teaching on some of this on Wednesday night. Pastor, Pastor Mark Connor and I have. Here's why I'm bringing this up right now because I'm going to read to you some prophetic stuff that's about to happen in the future, but you're going to have to decide whether or not you're going to participate in the ones that I want to talk about today. Now, you have the right to be able to do that. So in the sovereignty of God, God has fixed some things that, are, that no amount of prayer, no amount of crying, no amount of betting, no amount of declaring, no amount of fighting or anything else is going to change that. All you can do is make the choice of what he already says that's coming to you that's going to happen. It's either heaven or hell after you die, but you get to choose. You get to choose. In the choosing, in the choosing, you get to participate with the will of God. Amen? Just like last week, when we were talking about the promises of God, you remember the scripture that I used in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20? It says, all the promises of God. How many were there? I heard somebody say it. 5,467. You know how you get those promises? In him. 2 Corinthians 1 20 says, all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. The word amen means so be it, established, it's done. But the key is in him. There are some prophecies that's going to be extremely important for you and me to be in him. Hello, somebody. So it's important to be in him. So here in the sovereignty of God, God's got some things fixed in his future events. All right? You want to know what's in the future? First off, let me tell you, just like God, see this, this guy called Cyrus didn't serve the Lord God. There were times in his life that he had a chance to choose God fully. He was amazed at how God showed up for some of the people that he had, that some of the, the Jews that were in his kingdom. He was absolutely amazed. Y'all need to go read the book of Daniel if you hadn't. He was amazed. He was amazed. And then the successive kings that had a chance to deal with some of those Jewish people were amazed until they're all released to go back to, 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 to Judah. But he's amazed. So here's the thing. Here's what I want you to get today. Here's what I want you to get. We're about to land this plane, but you have to get everything that I've said up to this point. Are you ready? Are you ready? Say Amen. Are you ready to go home and eat chicken? Say amen. 
All right, I get it. Okay, but here's where we are. You need to get this. Band members, if you can kind of plan on coming on back. I know your fingers are still a little bit sore and your vocal cords are a little bit stretched, but help him, Jesus. Anyway, uh, so, so here, here's where it is. There are future events about to take place. And Cyrus looked like he did not have a choice in the matter, but in reality, the foreknowledge of God knew that it was going to happen. The foreknowledge of God is not causative, but he knows all things. Just because God knows it doesn't mean that causes it. The Bible says God is outside of time. He created time. He sees the end from the beginning. You're right, you know that? So, so God sees time outside of himself. And because he sees it all, he knows what's coming. But there are some things that when he's declared prophetically that's taken place, they're a part of his sovereign will. And then he gives man the right to choose if you want to participate in that. So I'm going to tell you some things that are fixed for the future. You ready to hear some? You ready to hear one? I'm going to talk to those of you just like Cyrus who didn't walk with God. He had, a, he had some things that he was going to participate in his future. Here are some for those of you that you may be rejecting Jesus. You may be... Uh, 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 not dedicated to the Lord, you may not be saved, I want to give some prophetic word for you, okay? And I'm not here to be mean, I just want to give you some prophetic word. Here's some prophetic word. It's in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. They're going to have it on the screen for you. Here's what it says. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth fled, uh, and from the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I said, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were open. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead and who were those who were in it. And death and Hades or hell delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. Friends, that is a prophetic reality. It is coming. You want to know what your future is if you're lost? I just read it for you. It doesn't matter what the government chooses. It doesn't matter if Republican or Democrat are in there. It doesn't matter if we still have a capitalistic society or a socialistic society. It doesn't matter if we have free health care or no health care. I'm telling you where we're headed right now is into the presence and the face of Almighty God. And for the lost person, it is at the great white throne. That is your future. You won't change that. Enough screaming, enough crying, enough begging won't do it. The only thing that will stop that is you choosing the blood of Jesus Christ. You choosing the way that God made. In God's sovereign will, he said, here is my son. I will give him as a ransom for you. If you will believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. You don't have to go to the great white throne. Amen? Amen? So, so listen to me. Listen to me, friend, who's got sin in your heart. I beg you, today, make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You say, you, you, you know, how, how does that work for me? You have to choose what's well, not in the cards for me. That's a bad idea of the sovereignty of God. God did not choose some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. That is a damnable doctrine that has hit the kingdom of God that happened way back during John Calvin's day. And there's Calvinist reformists, and I love you, but I'm telling you, he was wrong. He was wrong. God did not choose some to go to hell and some to go to heaven. He gave his son for every single human being that would ever live on the face of the planet to be able to accept Jesus Christ. I understand how attractive that is for a believer to want to believe in the sovereignty of God that nothing you could do would ever cost you your salvation, that nothing you could ever do would make the judgment of God fall on you. That's real good to make you. But you know what that says to the sinner? It says that I have no way out of this mess. I have no way to get beyond it. How can you preach to me of a salvation and a deliverance that I cannot receive? You see how terrible that doctrine is? It condemns somebody that has hope, that has no 
no hope to do it. And the Calvinists would say, well, if God chose it, it's good and it's holy. That's like you choosing your kids and you look at it when you're your kids and you say, I want to give you everything. And you look at the other one and say, I don't care if you die today. What kind of parent is that? That doesn't make God good. That doesn't show forth the book of Psalms that says the Lord is good and he does good. So that's the future of the wicked. But he said you can choose this day. Choose Christ and live. Here's what he says. Here's another. Listen, this is prophetic, but it's not going to sound prophetic in the beginning. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That don't sound prophetic right now because I'm in a room full of mostly Christians. But I'm going to tell you, you know the same blood that saved you when you were lost and undone is the same blood that a year from now when everything else is around you going crazy and you don't know what to do, the same name, the same name, the same name, the name of Jesus Christ is your hope and your salvation and your deliverance, your healer, your help, your strength. It is in Jesus. And any time you find yourself, that's always a prophetic word. When I get to the mom tomorrow and I don't know what to do, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. And because it's prophetic, meaning nothing that can be done, nothing that can be said. You might not like it, you might not like his name, but you can't stop it. It doesn't matter if you put me in a jail cell or you throw me in a corner somewhere. If I can just utter the name of Jesus, I know some help is coming to me. I know God is going to come to me and help me where I'm at somebody yes sir yes sir